what I was going to do is ask um, a few questions. First, each panelist to briefly introduce themselves and their company. Then I'll ask a couple just general questions on Israeli culture and the economy, and then some specific questions uh, to the panel about being successful entrepreneurs who happen to be Israelis. And then I'll invite the panel to ask each other a question and then open it up for a, a few questions to the, um, to the audience. So to start, um, Yaron asked that we just show a brief video from his company. Let me, I'll, I'll set it up maybe. I'm the founder of a company called uh, Outbrain. And uh, what we do, the, the video will just uh, show it better than uh, anything I say. But we're generally a recommendation engine for content on blogs and uh, newspapers. Um, let's hit that, and then I'll talk a, a bit about the company. You publish great content to your blog, but it's quickly lost once it moves off the homepage. How do you keep it alive forever? The Outbrain Thumbnail Widget links to your best posts with thumbnail images to help your readers discover all of your great content. Here's how it works. Outbrain analyzes your blog to identify related and popular posts and places links to them under each new post you write. It also adds thumbnail images above the links to enhance the look and feel of your site. The Thumbnail Widget is totally free and takes less than 60 seconds to install. Add a rating system and get feedback from your readers. Let them tell you what they think by adding either a thumbs up icon or a five star rater. The thumbnail widget has a sleek design without any powered by outbrain nonsense. Showing paid links to interesting articles on other sites is completely optional. You'll be able to see the jump in traffic in your outbrain reporting dashboard. Show off your best content now. Free and easy to install, Outbrain is a no-brainer. So that's what, what we do. It's uh, very simple. There's uh, not much more I can say about the, uh, the product. Uh, we've been doing this for about three years now. We're installed on about uh, 40, 45,000 uh, websites, most of them blogs, but also sites like uh, USA Today, Chicago Tribune, um, Seattle Times, etc., cetera, and, uh, and most of the newspapers in Israel as well. Uh, so uh, back to the being global from day one, we, we actually support about uh, 40 languages, and that's, again, out of uh, necessity. That, so the, the local, local market for us is, uh, is pretty small. Uh, again, we've been doing this for about three years, funded this by three VCs, uh, two in Israel, one in California, raised about $20 million to date. And uh, before that, I did another company called Quigo, which was a contextual ad network similar in ways to what you see, the, the Google ads that you see on content sites, uh, and did that for about eight years and sold it to AOL about three years ago, and started another small online ad company before that, and that was eventually acquired by, by a company that was acquired by Microsoft. So that's me. Okay, thank you, Ron. Next is uh, Ron from Five Men Media. Hi, my name is Ron Harnevo. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Five Min Media. Um, I guess everyone here knows YouTube. I wouldn't ask you if you know YouTube. How many of you are using Hulu on a regular basis? Um, Five Min Media is basically, I think, uh, what we're trying to do is to create the niche content side of the online video game. And we're trying, basically, uh, to renovate and create the new generation of cable networks. Um, the way we do it, we have our own and operated site, which is 5min.com, uh, but it's not really our, it's more of our showcase and our identity online. But what we are really doing is we're trying to take video online anywhere um, and help a lot of publishers that are dealing with uh, very niche um, uh, topics such as food, health, you know, the WebMDs of the world, the food networks of the world, um, and a lot of other vertical sites to fill their site within, uh, in seconds with videos that would be contextually matching to their articles. We license content. We have content deals with CBS, NBC, Scripps, uh, Hachette, Hearst, Meredith, Comcast, and all the, the, the big TV companies and some web production companies and DVD producers and PBS shows. And we go to the content producers with a premise to basically take their content to new websites they don't own. Then we take the content into our own and operated system. 
we create the right metadata and tools to deal with the curified premium content, and then we allow every publisher out there um, to take the videos on a contextual basis and to basically create a video player on the template of every page in their site, and we would read the page, understand the page contextually, and serve the right video within the page. So we can take a site like answers.com that has 34 million users and 1 million articles and put the right video within the right page within literally seconds. Um, the problem we're solving is the problem of content producers in a very, very fragmented web. I mean, the web becomes a huge, chaotic um, animal with millions of sites. And what 5min allows um, the big Comcast and Scripts of the world is to showcase and take their videos to site they don't own and make money there because the consumers are going in, in very weird path to a lot of sites. We work today um, with more than 700 uh, premium and retail sites. We have 32 million users in the US only. Um, and according to Comscore, we're the, today the biggest, video, uh, the biggest independent video property on the web. Um, we're streaming 100 million uh, videos a month. Um, and we're basically helping advertisers to replicate the um, cable channels by they're doing on TV into verticals with scale to the web. Um, and that's where our business model is. Thank you. Thank you, Amiad. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Amiad Salomon. I'm the founder of, of Peer39. Um, what Peer39 is is basically a data software company uh, in which we provide our data and technology to the very large and growing advertising market or internet advertising market. Uh, to make it uh, very put very simple, we have technology that understands pages to the meaning of it, to the sentiment of it, uh, or semantic uh, play it, um, and provide that piece, those pieces of data in real time so a companies can, can have relevant ads to content. So let's take a very simple example. If a page off of Newsweek political section comes up to our system, our machines know how to read that page very fast, understand that it's about Obama's health care plan, and assign attributes um, that this page has to have ads related to health care or to tax or to anything that was the content and the meaning of that page. Uh, and everything happens in milliseconds before the page loads. So it ha has to happen before the page loads in probably less than 50 milliseconds. So actually a relevant ad can come to the relevant page. Um, it's part of this growing uh, space on the internet, which is the demand and uh, the data platforms. Um, we believe we're in the next generation of targeting after contextual and behavioral targeting. Uh, we started the company in Israel four years ago. We're now 40 employees, raised $22 million um, from three VCs, uh, two, two US VCs and uh, one Israeli VC. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. The Israeli culture in general, and you heard Ayla speak a bit about that, like the Sabra, the prickly pear. To illustrate um, you know, some of the, the Israeli culture, that, that exterior, during the registration, I overheard one of my students ask a group of people gathered here um, a question. She, she asked if she could get some free legal advice on protecting the IP of her startup. And the American lawyer sneered, what's free legal advice? Then a, um, a software salesman from the Far East joked, what's intellectual property protection? And one of our Israeli panelists said, um, what's excuse me? So that idea of the tough exterior and being very direct um, you know, is, is something that you know, comes across when you read you know, Startup Nation or, or spend some time. But I think that um, you know, it's much more the, the sweet interior than the, the typical thorny exterior. But I was wondering if, if each of you would address a little bit that idea of some of the unique aspects of Israeli culture and society that have contributed to the entrepreneurial mindset, you know, the idea that you would go out and, and take a risk and not be afraid to fail and, and use the networks. And um, you know, perhaps touching on the role of uh, military service or, or immigration. And you know, perhaps you could, you each introduce your own company, but if you could speak a little bit about yourselves as well, that would be helpful. So we'll start again with your own. I'll talk about my military service uh, briefly, and um, it, I'm not the typical um, 
military service for, for most entrepreneurs uh, in Israel. I actually served in the Navy uh, for seven years. And what I think um, a lot of, uh, of the entrepreneurial spirit has to do with, uh, with the military service, and the book covers that greatly, really very detailed and, uh, and does a great job at that. So I'd, I'd highly recommend the book. Um, but the thing is, is that we're all drafted, and um, so it's mandatory, and you spend between, you know, minimum of three years for boys and two years for girls. And most of us uh, did seven, seven probably, and uh, don't know me yet, but uh, four, five, yeah. Um, and you, you get to do, it, it, and the other thing is we're all drafted, but it's not a long, it's not a career kind of service the way you have in, uh, in the US. And so most of the army is very, very young. And you get to do things uh, that you know, are unimaginable for, once you're out of the army, are unimaginable for you know, 10, 20 years and are definitely unimaginable for someone that never served in the army. You get to do those when you're, you know, 20, 21, 20, 24. So I was, um, I was managing a, or uh, interim captain of, uh, of a ship at, at 24, and that's an experience that you get, which again is going to be an unimaginable uh, outside. So you leave the army with uh, that kind of attitude of, you know, I can, I can manage stuff, I can do stuff that's, uh, that's uh, outside of my age scope or experience scope. And, uh, you know, you're, when you're in a military unit, you get that kind of mentality of there's nothing that, that we cannot do. <laughs> so I think that um, that's one aspect. You know, I'll let you take some more, and I'll come back to some others later. Um, I just interviewed someone uh, to a uh, to work, I think it was two days ago. She was 23. Um, highly, highly ambition. Um, and she knew exactly who she wants to be. It was amazing. Like, she told me exactly, like, where did she learn? Where did she graduate? Where she's going to study? What she's going to do? And I was shocked because I didn't know what I'm going to do when I was 23. I just didn't know that I'm not going to keep serving in the Army. I've been in the Army until I was 25. Um, serving in the Air Force, I flew F-4s. And I just knew that in the first time, I knew I'm going to serve for seven years, which is the minimum, uh, if you uh, finish the Israeli Air Force Academy, and move on. And I always tell to my mind that the best gift I ever got from the Army was the fact that I didn't have to choose what I want to do when I, when I was young. Uh, and then you're 26 or 25, because I traveled a little bit, so, and then I had to decide, I think you're a bit smarter. Um, I hope, when you're 25. Um, I think that the Army piece, gives Israelis a lot, a lot of um, independence. You know, we leave our homes when we were 18, and uh, we need to take decisions that, I can tell you that I did very complex things when I was 22. It took me three or four years afterwards when I was out of the army to get into the same positions and decision-making situations that I experienced when I was in the army. Um, so, you know, you're just being educated that you need to decide, you need to improvise, which not only helps Israelis, it also messes us up. We are the, uh, the masters of improvisation, um, which is great when you start a startup and again it gets complicated when the startup evolves. Um, and I, I, I think that the army is uh, a very major um, point in our involvement as entrepreneurs, but it's also the society. I mean, I never paid for my lawyer uh, and our accountant and our workers, until we got the seed money, they all were, all right, pay me later. I actually pitched the company to the lawyer, and he decided if he believes in the idea, so no. And uh, when he said, all right, I believe in it. So we did a thing that we will pay him after the seed money, and you now we work with him until today. I think there's, so the army would be one, and the second thing is that everyone supports you um, to take, to, you know, to live the, the regular kind of path and be an entrepreneur, which is something that I don't think you can experience elsewhere in, in such a volume. Yeah, so I think that um, actually the three of us probably repre don't represent the regular uh, entrepreneur. I think uh, I was in a commando unit, uh, and, and like your own and, uh, and, um, and Ron, I think we were exposed to do very complicated things at uh, very early stages, uh, sometimes alone. Uh, and I think that uh, contributed a lot. Actually, a lot of entrepreneurs in Israel come from uh, the intelligence forces or from the computer, or, you know, Checkpoint is a good example that all three founders were in the same unit uh, from, 
you know, developing software. But I, I do agree that uh, the Army uh, is definitely a good place, and I think enough was spoken about it. I think another aspect would be um, more on the immigrant side. I think uh, without knowing the backgrounds of, of our friends here, uh, if you take two generations back, uh, in most cases, people are immigrants. Uh, some, some people just moved now, but uh, either our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents you know, moved in some very hard times uh, to Israel. Um, and I think that kind of spirit of still early, early stages of, of a country in development really is, is kind of um, a lot of what's going on of people uh, want to be successful and willing to take a big risk uh, to be successful. Uh, and I think it's part of the culture. I'm sure in America, you know, when uh, 300 years ago or so on, there was much more entrepreneurship and innovation in like any country uh, there are. And I think that you see in America too, a lot of the immigrants uh, are the ones that are very, very successful. Look at the Google founders uh, and others. And I think that's something that uh, you kind of grew up with uh, in Israel. Hopefully it will stay in a few hundred years uh, too. But uh, just to complete on that side, I think the army is, is, is a very important uh, part of it. And, but more the atmosphere uh, and kind of the, you know, the, the landscape in which you grow on. Thank you. The other um, question, a general question I wanted to ask is um, not so much about the culture, but Israel's economy itself in fostering um, technology innovation and the formation of entrepreneurial ventures. You know, aspects more surrounding political policy, taxation, legal issues, financial markets, and things such as the current economic conditions, global trade, security concerns, et cetera. So could you talk um, a bit more about the macro economy um, and, and how you believe Israel has been successful in, in fostering this, this startup nation? So I think that there were very few things that, that Israel did and did right and uh, helped uh, foster all the innovation, like the Yosma project, which was the kickstarting of, of all the VC. Uh, uh, industry, but it, I think um, on most of those points that you touched, uh, all this entrepreneurship and innovation has happened. Um, uh, not, you know, <laughs> so it, it, what? In spite yeah. of, in spite of, um, uh, of government and regulation, like the tax uh, tax stuff in Israel is a total mess. Uh, no one really knows what the tax laws are, including the tax authorities. So. Uh, um, you know, those things are not necessarily, um, I, I think, what caused uh, the innovation. A lot of, uh, you know, us as, as entrepreneurs or innovators, uh, I think one of our traits is uh, the ability to kind of swim in, in a world of chaos and, and unpredictability and not knowing uh, where we're going to. And I think uh, Israel, on that respect, I don't think is um, you know something you'd want to actually replicate in other countries you're looking to foster innovation in. Okay, well, I'll touch that, and I'm I'm totally in agreement with with your own. Uh, if, if you're Israeli, you, you live in a seven million people country, so the markets are are relatively small. Um, and then you know the only dream is global. And I don't know how many of you, le you know, lived in, in small countries. I don't think it's an Israeli thing. But the only dream, like the only way to make it big is go global. Um, and in a way, I always say that the Internet is the real Wild West these days. You know, it allows you to, to, to have, you know, a lot of shortcuts. Uh, and if you don't do them in such a small country with the taxation and the mess and the countries, you know, small countries usually have 20 to 30 to 40 families that basically run the business for everyone else. Um, and I think that the opposite, it just happens because Israelis thrive, you know, to break through, um, not to get captured in, in, I would say, a loop of a small market that doesn't really give you the, the ability to innovate. Um, and therefore, if you can, you know, I... Uh, we raised money in, in the U.S. We raised 13 million. I didn't say it from two American VCs. Um, the Israeli VCs didn't want to put money in us. We're not really we're not doing a typical kind of technology thing. We're more of a media players. Uh, we just took a plane here. Um, you know, got some connections from people from France from, and I think we met like Talis here is my other co-founder like 60, 70 VCs. Like we knocked on every door. Hello, we want money. Um, until we find someone that gave us. And I, I would say that Israel's economy is the inspired thing. The Israel economy basically thrives you to try and create something bigger and go global and not the opposite. 
Okay, thank you. And Tell's also here as um, as the wingman or the backup yeah. because uh, Ron may be having a child at any moment yeah. and may have to run out. So I'll tell you ahead of time and congratulations ahead of time. Uh, Amiad? Yeah, I think that um, yeah, uh, two things. I think that uh, from, from a macro perspective, I think back to your question, I think uh, Israel has to do um, a lot more and focus on the technology, which is really our advantage in Israel. So, you know, echoing on what Ron is saying, I think that really if you look even 30, 20, 30 years ago, uh, it was very hard to break in uh, to make it very big in Israel because of the fact that I would say that 10 families controlled uh, m most, of, uh, most of the wealth in Israel and still uh, some of them uh, still control it. But really the first wave of people who managed to do uh, very well are in technology where it's not really around connections and it's not really about, you know, kind of who do you know the government and getting all kinds of, um, you know, special treatments. It was really for the innovation. And I think the first wave of companies in the high-tech sector um, really boomed it. And you saw very, very successful people that are starting to enter us, entering like the Forbes list of Israel uh, coming from technology. And that's becoming more and more um, effective as the internet is evolving and the technology uh, sector is evolving. And you see the dynamics changing, uh, not only with those um, very wealthy families, but also the spread of wealth in Israel. While maybe 20, even 20 years ago, there was, you know, the, 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 the average uh, between the very high net worth of individuals and the average person was like maybe like Russia today. Um, today in Israel, even people who are not their entrepreneurs themselves and are not you know making the big exits, the average salary uh, for a software developer for us in Israel is the same as in New York right now. The you know we're spending, um, we're hiring engineers here right now, where we relocated engineers from Israel to here. We're paying the same amount of money. Uh, in Tel Aviv or uh, in Tel Aviv and in New York City. So you're seeing that the wealth, uh, not only the, you know, the big millionaires, but also kind of the day-to-day -day people, engineers, software engineers, databases, network, appliances, uh, are doing very well in Israel uh, comparatively to here. And I think that's becoming part of that uh, graph that she was showing, that the high-tech is becoming kind of really, uh, the biotech and high-tech and, and all the high-technology sectors are becoming the drive of Israel growth. The next questions I wanted to go to have to do more with the, the panelists as successful entrepreneurs who, who happen to be Israeli, um, as opposed to the general um, culture and economy of Israel. And that's what specifically uh, motivated you to, to become an entrepreneur, and how did you acquire the skills along the way? And both the, the general skills of, of running a business, but more specifically, each of you have um, technical skills so you know a lot of people can start a, a general services business but where did you acquire uh, the technical skills or find the technical talent you need to actually make these you know very high volume uh, performance um, sites work we're three founders uh, i think we're different in that sense from other um from my friends here because um, we needed to share we went into the media space which is not one of the most developed areas in in israel um, so one of us is a technologist, and he lived, and, and he basically worked in, in, in a company that was IPO'd in $2 billion in the London Stock Exchange. He was one of the leading uh, engineers. Um, Tal is an advertiser, and I worked in a newspaper, in the print media, uh, which is not recommended, by the way. Um, so the, th the, 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 the three of us came from, from, from two different places, and I, I think that really what what, what really, if, if we're speaking in the Israeli context, and even if not, we needed help. Like, if I had raised money in Israel, uh, we wouldn't have been where we are right now. We needed help. We needed to come here um, and get some help from media executives and RVCs who were helping us a lot in the beginning on, on navigating and networking and closing the deals I just described with Comcast. So we had the raw idea. We understood the web. Uh, I think the web is global in the sense that if you get it, you get it. And if you understand that something needs to be done, um, then you can make it. I think that what Israel gave us is just, there's a lot of VCs in Israel. And even though they didn't like us, we understood that you can raise money. I've been to uh, Spain in a competition. We were nominated to one of the five most successful startups in Europe in 2007. And I spoke to Spanish and French entrepreneurs. They don't know where the money is. Um, they don't know where to raise it, they don't know how to find it, and they don't really believe that they can do it. Um, so I think that the fact that you can, that everyone knows that money is out there, and the country, 
um, you know, encouraging entrepreneurialism in the sense that you can find it was something that really, really helped us uh, to shape our way through. And, and I think that's what nice about the global world, because we couldn't have made it from Israel only. Um, we, sh we needed the American support, knowledge, employees in order to be where we are right now, which is not a success yet, just to put it in context. And I'm proud to say one of the uh, employees, when I announced this uh, event in my class, one of my students raised their hand and said, I work for Ron. <laughs> yeah, one of our interns. Uh, so um, so I, I don't have a technology uh, background, actually. Uh, I started by, uh, I started my own web design shop. I uh, did most of my studying from reading magazines. Uh, I studied a few years uh, um, product design in the university, but never graduated. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I, I, and I guess I studied entrepreneurship through uh, through mistakes, just uh, just going at it and, and being tenacious. In my second company, which was the one we sold uh, to AOL, we couldn't raise money for the first four years. Uh, in hindsight, I, I think. Every one of the investors that we met during those four years was absolutely right not to invest in us because we were, uh, you know, we were doing all the all the mistakes possible. So, um, uh, so that's how I studied uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, what else did you ask? <laughs> the other, um, you know, I, ways of, of of overcoming some of the, the technical side as well. Mm -hmm. So that was at. Um, were you able to teach yourself all that you needed to know? Was uh, the real challenge hiring people with that that skill? Yeah. So in both companies, my co-founders were the technologists, uh, and usually I, uh, we start companies in uh, in small groups. So technology is uh, is definitely part of it. Uh, I think for me specifically, one of the things that we realized over time, uh, and all of my businesses have been in publishing and advertising online is that most internet companies are actually not technology companies. And that's, uh, that's kind of a, um, a switch that, that people, folks in Israel, mostly have to do because we're very technology oriented and we think technology solves everything. Uh, but most internet businesses are not, are not really selling technology. I, I'd argue that almost all businesses on the web today are not technology companies, including uh, Google. Google is a media company and an advertising company. Technology has to be, has to be good, and it, it has to be as good as account management and as good as marketing. Uh, and so, it, one of the realizations for us, and it took us about four or five years at, at my first company, was um, you know technology has to work, but uh, it's not. We're not selling technology to to our customers. They don't really care about what's you know what's going on behind the scenes. And uh, that, uh, you know, I, I don't think many, many entrepreneurs, uh, or I think there are quite a few uh, more entrepreneurs that need to make that switch. But uh, um, once you make it, I think it makes, um, it puts technology in, in perspective yeah. and it makes it much more achievable. All right. I, I think that, um, you know, while uh, I agree that most web companies, um, uh, or not only web companies in general, you know, are really or have to focus more on the solution that they're offering uh, than the technology. There definitely tends to be in Israel kind of, you know, here we have a great technology now. Let's find what to do with it. Uh, and it happened to us. Uh, it happened to you know most companies I know that basically you build something, you're far away from the market. Uh, my story, you know, we started the company in Israel for the first two years, two and a half years. Uh, I was in Israel you know, flying back and forth every second week, but it's not like being here. It's not like being close to the market and talking to clients every day. Um, and it took some time for us to refine the technology and actually to find the model. We went through two or three models uh, before we hit what we believe is the right model for us. Um, right now, you know, literally from a year ago where we were, you know, maybe doing, uh, I don't know, two, three, five, 10, 15 impressions per second. Uh, last week we did 5,000 impressions per second. So once you find the right model and you're able to scale on it, um, you can do it well. But I think I, I, I can agree more with your own. The, the key thing is to understand that what you're selling is a product uh, to a specific market. The technology is just, just an enabler of how to do it in, in the most, most efficient way. That's a good point. There's a saying, the uh, engineer's dilemma, which is why give the customer what they want when we know what they need. And you know, sometimes you, you forget that it's, what's important is the, uh, is the market need. The um, other question I wanted to ask you about um, being successful entrepreneurs is just generally what are some of the, the big 
challenges uh, you faced and how you overcame them? And what lessons might you offer for um, quite a few people raise their hand in the audience that they're, they're entrepreneurs or would like to get into entrepreneurship? So if you could speak about um, some of the challenges you overcame them, uh, some of the challenges you faced, how you overcame them, some lessons learned, and perhaps you know comparing and contrasting uh, those challenges in Israel and the U.S. and and um, you know lessons learned. And so, so I think there are two aspects of it. I think from a technical perspective, um, you know, for us, we were fortunate to be able to raise money uh, quite easily in the last three rounds. Uh, it's not always the case, not in the, my previous company or in other areas, um, but it's usually a, a challenge. Although there's a lot of VCs and a lot of money, the actually the chances for you to be an unknown entrepreneur and to knock on a VC door without them knowing you and to raise money is very low, uh, still very, very low. And I think there's a whole ecosystem that you have to know the game to actually uh, get funding out of it. Uh, but I think as a, you know, it's a whole discussion that, you know, we can talk about it once. But I think that the most um, uh, challenging thing for us, for me, for the company, is actually to keep going. Uh, you know, a startup is a roller coaster. And, you know, the highs are very highs and the lows are very, very low. You know, sometimes you invest so much money in a direction and it just doesn't, doesn't work. And there's a whole board and investors and you're not operating solo. And to c continue uh, regardless of, you know, you mentioned a few stories before of all the problems that you have and continue motivating your people who are not necessarily uh, founders or not necessarily at the same stage that you are to have the same enthusiasm and hard work uh, despite the changes and shifts you have to make. I think that's the number one, that, um, number one challenge that we had of kind of continuing and making sure that everyone's on board and who is ever not on board uh, to let off the boat, um, that that can affect the whole group uh, if that's not the case. That was in our, in our run. For me, it's easy. I'd say my number one tip would be uh, to to be brutally focused and uh, and you know as, as a start of in entrepreneurs, we don't have the luxury of uh, of working on multiple things or multiple features or multiple products, and we hardly have the, the truth is we hardly have the luxury of working on on one very small focused uh, thing. So that would be, um, you know, my, my first tip is to be brutally focused and to try to always strive to find the minimal, the minimal product that can actually be sold to a client and not, not the maximal product. So not, you know, how can we get more features in so this addresses a bigger market and more customers. Uh, I'd say get, you know, have the joy of cutting features and looking for a more focused uh, proposition. And a great example from recent years, uh, you know, couldn't find a, any better example than Facebook, which is kind of on its way to world domination, and uh, um, and that's going to be the web, et cetera. But when they started about five years ago, it was a system for uh, for Harvard students to put in their their. Facebook, right? Do their uh, their phone and uh, contact information, and if you were across the street in MIT, you could not use Facebook for the first uh, year and a half or so. Uh, and then after you know that kind of brutal focus, which is just the contact information, just for Harvard, they expanded to five universities for about a year. And then they said the next after about a year it would be uh, all universities, but you had to have an edu uh, email. And it took another about a year until they said, okay, we'll allow these 20 companies to have their employees use Facebook. So I think it's a wonderful. You know, we we tend to look at the outcome and the end result, which is world domination. So we'll do the next uh, Facebook killer and all that. But they were brutally focused uh, all along the way, and I think uh, that that's the most important trait for. Uh, for entrepreneurs, and I'll just add the second, which is uh, about financing, and uh, I think it, it sort of relates to this. Usually when we talk to investors, we're so in love with what we developed with our product and with everything that, that can be done, and uh, and we you know we start expanding on all those things that can be done. We can do this technology and that and this feature and that, but the truth is is that um, Investing is not uh, investing in startups, at least, is not a financial transaction. It's an emotional and human uh, storytelling kind of transaction. And to get finance for you know for for a private company that has nothing, you don't know what the share price is, et cetera. It's just uh, an idea. Uh, what you need to do really well is tell a good, compelling, and simple story. It's a human being that's sitting in front of you, not a financial machine. So uh, you know, it's it's about 
getting that essence of what's a good story and, and you get to choose what the story is. It could be you know, your experience or you're a domain expert, you sold companies, that's a great story. Or it could be uh, you know, having that single core functionality that you've already l released and you can show a story in a chart which is here are four or five months of growth. It might be you know, 100 people using it, so not 100 million. But you can show the growth, so that's a great story, and, and, and investors can relate to that and understand that if you increase your usage uh, uh, month over month for four months, they can invest in, in that kind of growth. So um, I think it's about finding a core, very simple uh, story and really keeping, uh, staying focused to that. Um, two things in short. My mother always told me the biggest enemy of, perp the biggest enemy of good enough is perfect. Don't try to be perfect. Now we have a tendency to try and develop things instead of just taking something very, very simple, get it out there if it's in on the internet or whatever, and just see how the audience respond to it. Um, instead of thinking for the audience and trying to be over sophisticated, just keep it simple, take it live, you know, put it on air if we're speaking uh, about the web. Um, I can tell you that I, I remember when I was editing a newspaper. I was, w I was working in a weekly newspaper and every Friday morning when the newspaper was released I was going to a coffee shop next to my house and I was looking at people watching the newspaper. I was actually staring at how they read the newspaper. Because I thought when I was editing it that they will keep their eyes on this picture and they wouldn't read that one and I was looking to see what they're doing. And I think that entrepreneurs are stupidly optimistic, which is a necessity. You've got to be stupidly optimistic because you get 95% of no's and 5% yes to what you're saying. But they fell in love with their story, meaning that you say it again and again and again. You have a concept, and you fall in love with the concept. And you forget to listen to the audience, right? So we, we, we started with putting a destination on air, 5min.com. It has 5 million Americans that are using it right now. It's great, it's not big enough. You know, we have 30 million people that are watching our videos on other sites. And I remember the kind of eureka moment when we realized that as beautiful as our site would be, when people need solutions on the web, they go to Google. And it's almost regardless of the beauty and the, they just go to Google, it's easy for them. You know, you go to the supermarket that is close, the closest one to your home. And we realized that niche content is commoditized. And then we realize that all we have to do is to push our content to other sites and help them get videos on their site because, the, you know, we just watch them behaving. And, and as much as we were in love in our story, we had to change. So I think that flexibility and, and you know, A-B test, like listen to what the audience says on your product, even if you're in love with it and they hate it, you got to take a turn. And I think that's what makes you a good entrepreneur if you're willing to take turns from the original ID. There's the expression that a, a pessimist is an optimist with experience. I don't necessarily believe that, but um, it, it is difficult. And I just have, I tell my students, and I, and I started a few companies, but I always have that image of the old bows for the older group, the, the punching clown, the bows with the little sand on them where you punch in and he keeps just popping up with a big smile on his face and you know, often that's what's required. Um, before, I'm going to open it up to, to Q&A from the audience, but before I do, I, I would invite, uh, for a slightly different format, um, would invite the panelists to ask each other a question, you know, that they may be uh, particularly interested in that would be of, uh, you know, insight and, and value for the, uh, for the audience. So, before I go to the, uh, to the audience, do you have a, a question any of the panelists would like to ask any other panelists? I'll, I'll ask your own question. Please, thank you. I actually wanted to ask you that for a long time. So, <laughs> uh, there's a book of Sarah Lacey. She's uh, she writes about startups. In in um, the answer is yes. <laughs> to make sure that it's it wasn't luck. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll ask and then I'll tell you what he answered and we'll move on. So the book called uh, Once You Lucky, Twice You're Good. And she goes and she interviews uh, serial entrepreneurs that were able to sell their companies twice. I don't know, I mean, I never sold a company and I'm not sure that if I sell a company, I'll keep on working so hard. Um, so I wanted to, for Iran to explain to me why he's a serial entrepreneur and he answered that. You wanna answer it? 
Yeah, so uh, that, uh, that's part of it for sure to, you know, it's sort of uh, A-B testing on life, right? To, um, it, it worked out once. We sold, uh, I sold uh, one company and, uh, and it's interesting to know whether it was uh, just luck or, or not. So that's one, one reason I think. Uh, the other is, I think there's just the fun of uh, the game. So building these companies, uh, if if you, you know, if you don't take them too much to heart, it's at the end of the day, it's a uh, it's a game, and there's a score at the end, which is uh, nice. I you know, I couldn't care less about the uh, about the money piece of it, but uh, it's it's nice to have score on it, and it's not it's it's nice to to play the game with a team that I enjoy. I have the luxury this time to hire a team that I greatly enjoy coming to work with. And, uh, you know, especially in the internet where you have so many, so much competition and you have no idea who's coming at you and when Google will release a, a competing uh, product and stuff like that. It's just, a, um, it's fun from a strategy kind of problem solving um, uh, perspective. So that's pretty much it. I, I enjoy this greatly. I, I suffered the first uh, four or five years at the previous company, mostly because we were absurdly underfunded. It took us uh, four years to get our first uh, real funding, uh, and that's, that's a lot of pain. Uh, but this time we're well-funded, great team, and it's, uh, it's a joy so far. I mean, what would I do? Sit on the beach forever? No. It's a, uh, <laughs> to continue on the cliches, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And on that, that, that passion and wanting to keep doing it, to I plug the book, I would also, um, one of great speeches, if you can, don't Google it, but go to one of the video sites is um, Steve Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford University. If you just go to Steve Jobs, Stanford 2005, it's a, it's a wonderful 14-minute speech, but on that and, and the passion for the work. Um, great. And another question. Um, your own, do you have a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll reta retaliate. Uh, so Ron is uh, is actually a, a very uh, unique Israeli entrepreneur because, uh, as he mentioned, uh, he launched a destination site, which uh, there are very few destination direct-to-consumer businesses uh, that have launched uh, from Israel. Um, and that, again, relates to what I said before, which is we're very technology-obsessed and not very much uh, consumer-obsessed. So uh, my question to you is, uh, has the DNA of the company, as far as it relates to destinations and direct-to-consumer, changed with the move from Israel to here? Did uh, it matter? You know, I, I always, not, not always, because when I speak about Israeli entrepreneurs, I, I think we're not typical, right? That's why we never got money from Israeli VCs, because the Israeli DNA is technology, patents, um, and I, you know, and I think the industry in Israel were not able. You just said the internet is product, uh, and the internet is media. The internet is solving problems, which is something I always say. Like it's not about the patent, it's not about the algorithm, it's not about the technology. Twitter didn't reinvent the wheel. It's media. So is Facebook, by the way. Um, so I think that we just did what we knew, because uh, we are media people. As, as entrepreneurs, we're not, we didn't spend time in uh, doing a lot of algorithm. We were very consumer facing in our previous works. Um, and I think that in here, we realized that we're not first as stupid as we thought for a while, because um, people really realized, oh, so you're a media company. And said, yes, okay. And then they asked the, the, the right question. Um, and second, I think we learned a lot after moving here how to run a media business. And in that respect, I think that the U.S. is, you know, people here understand consumer in a way. Um, I actually disagree about marketing for Israeli companies. I think they don't know how to do it in generalization. I think they're very focused in the technology and they don't understand branding, logos, you know, how do you get your message out, how do you crystallize your story, and th I think we're not good enough in that. So yeah, I think that the US was a brilliant school for us. I, I think that, uh, just to echo here, I think that uh, uh, it's true that, uh, I was actually in a, on a, on a panel in Israel, there was a big uh, VC type of event, and it was a panel, and there was a question there, could Israel uh, produce a Facebook or a Twitter? Um, 
and not from a technology perspective, from a mindset perspective of understanding the product and understanding uh, kind of what people want more on the social side. Um, and I think that most people uh, thought that Israel cannot uh, produce that. I, I actually, uh, I disagree. I think that it's becoming very, very global. Um, in the same way that uh, the folks from Israel, you know, they founded like companies like uh, ICQ and the messengers and Skype was invented outside of the US. And more and more sites, true that when you're here, I mean, you can get the, that crowd. But I think that it's becoming more and more people are becoming more immersed in the product side and the innovation side. Uh, I agree 100% with Ron. And if you knock on the door of an Israeli VC with a consumer play, your chances of getting funded are very low. Uh, but really, to see it at a larger scale, what? For a good reason. Yeah, for a good reason. But I think that that's becoming there are more and more interesting stuff like that. And I, I'm not sure you have to be at Harvard uh, to start at Facebook. Thank you. I'll um, open up if there's a, a couple of questions from the audience. Hi, my name is Malcolm Elvey, and I'm a parallel entrepreneur. I used to be a serial entrepreneur, but now I'm retired. I do lots of things. <laughs> <coughs> One of the things I'm doing is I'm writing a book. It started out as a regular book, and it's now developed into what I call a MOOC. So I have the URL MOOCs.com, Multimedia Books. I'm publishing the book tomorrow on the iPad, and it is really multimedia, using video, text, combining, and we think in a very unique way. I've only actually prepared one chapter. I've done interviews with about four people, and the interviews are because question, of <coughs> the, qu the question, question is, is, what is the price that I charge for the first chapter? Bearing in mind, uh, Wired Magazine and Chris decided that free was a good idea. Do I publish it for free, or can I charge 99 cents, or $1.99? Go for it. Um, look, I, I actually, I mean, in our video space, we also um, are dealing with the freemium economy. I'll tell you my take. Everything that is commoditized by nature need to be free. Everything that is long-tailed, very, very interesting, and not a lot of supply, can be charged. I think that if the New York Times would charge for news, their business would get smaller because they can get news elsewhere. Um, in our business, like if you want a recipe, you know, there's some companies that were willing to give us the recipes for free, and some companies want us to charge the consumers, and I, I just thought they would never pay because they can get it elsewhere for free. So the question is, how commoditized are the interviews? Um, and the market, and if can people find other things, you know, things that are similar to what you did for free. And if they're not, which seems they're not, then I think you can, you can go and charge. This is my take on what should be free and what should we charge for. Okay, and um, there's a great journal article called Versioning by Hal Varian and Carl Shapiro just on that topic. I had a a dot-com uh, company called Stock Central back in the 90s, and we were looking at, at just that problem. And it, it's wonderful how to version information when the marginal cost of production is zero. The next question, which is truly a question. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Ron. Uh, basically, if you look at the video content, there's three types of content, high-end, mid-end, and low-end, even though it's not really low-end. But your business model really requires you to have access to high-end content, which is produced by big media companies because that's what attracts real bad dollars. Now, if you look at lately the trend, big media companies, they don't want others to distribute the content. And you can see that this even with Hulu model, which is owned by big media companies, but they're trying to keep the content out of Hulu. So what are your plans for the future to address the issue of big media companies sort of trying to distribute the content themselves instead of giving to others? And even YouTube has that problem right now. And demand media, how cast everybody, I mean. I'll be very short because I think it's very industrial and I wouldn't want to bore anyone else. Um, I'll tell you one thing about content. Content is getting commoditized because it's cheaper to produce it. The fact that there are so many blogs right now and every one of you can open a blog and be an opinion leader actually brings content to a stalling to, to, to a place where it's getting commoditized. The Hulu and the NBC and this like Lost is not commoditized yet, right? It's a franchise. People want to see Lost. And it's really, really hard to replicate lost with small dollars. So the franchise TV 
is not even close to get commoditized. Therefore, Comcast and NBC wouldn't want you to see it for free. On the other hand, recipes, health tips, tips for entrepreneurs, the production value is cheap, you can create great content with low cost, it gets commoditized much faster than entertainment. Therefore, I think that they wouldn't, if, if scripts would take my content back to scripts, I have enough recipes without them that were produced in very low cost by amazing producers. So, depends what you produce. Um, I think the TV content is here with us to stay when it comes to entertainment. On the niches, I think that the commodity would just happen much, much faster, which is the space we work at. Yeah, I was interested in the networks that you leverage to go global, and in particular, if you find a real benefit to the, the Jewish, Jewish diaspora, and whether you were able to leverage that. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say that we uh, use the Jewish network, uh, but we definitely use the network. Um, so you know, for us, one of the things I think we did right is build the right advisory board early on in the company of people who are not just the name, but uh, that actually um, put some money in. It doesn't have to be significant amount of money, but to, just to show a commitment into the company and uh, really open their um, kind of their uh, connections uh, to us. I think that uh, that helped us to um, help us a lot in the financing, a lot in the financing. As I mentioned before, I think it, you have a much better chance if you're in part of the game. Uh, to raise money than someone coming outside for a VC or to an investor you don't have, um, as well as to get to uh, the right clients. Although, I must say that I think on that, it's mostly the company on the operation side for the company, the CEO, you know, the sales guys to open the doors because at the end of the day, the investors are um, very, very busy with your investment, but then after they invested, they're looking at other investments and they have 10 board seats. Uh, so a lot of it is in the company level. But I, I would definitely say that we build the network uh, and continuing to build a network. Uh, but uh, I would say it's important to have not just the name because that just kind of goes away, but with people um, that actually work. And we actually changed people. We took people off the advisory board who we didn't see uh, are actually adding value to the company. So that's the network we used. Thank you. And a question, oh, I'm sorry. No, I want to reiterate, I don't think there was any, uh, any use of the Jewish network. I wouldn't know what that, that even is. Um, so a lot of, uh, I think, networking through uh, Israeli entrepreneurs and other, other companies working in our space, but not, uh, I don't know what the Jewish network would be. I, I asked that because the Irish government are trying to do that with, the, uh, with Irish people throughout the world. So I just wondered if it was a, a power. So I think, again, the Israeli network is definitely something that's, uh, that's active and, um, and, and helpful. And uh, is Gil still here? Um, no, nope, yeah. I guess not. But the, the consulate here is very proactive in helping Israelis connect with Israelis and network. But that would be folks, you know, the, the Israeli network, not the Jewish diaspora network. Yeah. My name is Tom Kornblit. Uh, I'm a young entrepreneur from Pace University in Westchester. Uh, I, like I just have a t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Israeli too. Uh, I just have a quick question. Uh, during your search, you guys said you guys got 95% yes, I mean 95% no and 5% yes. Uh, how'd you deal with, why do you guys keep going? Why didn't you just stop when you heard no? You know, you kept saying getting no and no. What made you keep going? And what did you do different when you finally got the yes? What did you do different with the, when you presented your project to the investors? How come, what did you do differently? So I got the right to answer. Um, so first of all, I think you have to realize the business uh, of uh, investing is a 95 or 99 percent no business. A, a VC's work is really saying no, that they hardly ever say yes. So that that's their business. And I think once you understand that as uh, an entrepreneur, uh, you embrace the no. Uh, today, for funding this company, when I got to VCs that gave me a straight no, that was that was a blessing. That's like almost, it's a 99% of the, of the joy you get from a yes. Just because 
it's off the table and you're free to, to go on and find that one VC that will actually say yes. So I think that's, that's interesting. It's, if you don't understand that, it's hugely frustrating. And it's, uh, you know, you look at these VCs and they should be investing in taking risk. That's what we all say to ourselves. They're not taking any risk and yada, yada. But they're, you're going to get 99% um, uh, no's. And then, so I think tenacity helps. You have to be tenacious. And that, going back to Israel, I think is one of the advantages of uh, the Israeli mentality, mentality is really be being extremely tenacious and not letting go. And the other thing I think is just uh, really crystallizing your story to a very simple human story and not, um, you know, not, not trying to cover too much or say you're going to conquer the world because you start diluting your story. It's really about finding a very simple story that you can uh, I just add, even add another step to this that's for that what you want to saying I would say that um, you should practice practice on the VCs that you don't need their money um, I'm taking it to an extreme but uh, what we are doing is you know know who you really want money from and don't talk to them at all I mean you have to practice and refine your message and get all the no's on the people that you don't really care about uh, and when you're ready to it, after you know 10 or 15 or 20 people have told you no, you'll know enough about you know what's good, what's not good, what's working and all, and really go to the people that you want money from. Uh, with the VCs, especially, if you get a no, it's very hard to get them back. I mean, it's, I I don't know if there was ever a kind of a story of people kind of that came back and said, oh, we were wrong, we should invest here. Very very few stories like that. So I would probably start the other way around and go to the people that you want last. I'll I'll just add one short thing. You need to ask why. Why did you got the no? And sometimes you'll just hear answers that you wouldn't agree with. And you know, you'll just say, all right, so they're not smart. <laughs> and I told you, stu stupidly optimistic. And sometimes the no would be brilliant. I can tell you that I remember that I got back from the West Coast to Israel one time. We got like seven or eight no's that were really, really articulated. People like I, we insisted to understand why did we got the, get the no, and they explained. And I remember myself saying, "I'm not, I'm not insulted. Give it to me." And if you're ready to get the criticism and understand why you got the no, then there's a, a, a good room for improvement. Ian, a uh, to plug another book, uh, Guy Kawasaki wrote, you know, and I share this with my students: shut up, take notes, and and regurgitate. And it is really important. To, to understand that and to put in a plug for another program we do at Pace is the pitch contest where people come in and they have three minutes to do a pitch and it's every December and we give over $50,000 in cash prizes for a three minute pitch and the reason people come from schools around the country is that opportunity to get the feedback from the, from the VCs and the angels and the real beauty is, is you know getting, getting that kind of feedback and improving. We had a, a question over here from Dave. Hi, my name is David Light. I'm uh, an attorney at Lowenstein Sandler, where we represent a lot of tech companies, including a lot of uh, Israeli companies coming into the U.S. market. Um, my question for all of you is that you know I couldn't help but notice that you're all from web media content companies, um, and I'm wondering where else in Israel, what other sectors do you think are uh, you know important sectors uh, for technology in Israel, like? clean tech or, or wherever else you think it is. I, I just, it struck me that you were all sort of web 2.0 type companies. I, I just think, I mean, uh, I, I, we were just talking about it. I think that this represents really uh, more the web companies. And I think a lot of the software and hardware companies are actually based in California, um, where there's a lot of uh, traditional kind of connections to, to the big companies. Um, I think the big sectors are, you know, software and, and internet are big. Uh, what's becoming very big in Israel is the medical device um, space, which is uh, you know doing very well. Uh, but I think really New York represents more the web, uh, just because it's closer to Israel. You know, a lot of the media companies are here, a lot of our clients are here, a lot of the relationships we can have here. While traditionally, like all the major software and hardware companies are actually based in Silicon Valley or in Boston. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions. I'm going to have one here and, and one at the other side. Um, David Tedden, former, formerly resident Israel serial entrepreneur. I wanted to ask, how serious do you think a problem is is ongoing Yerida? You probably know Israel has a higher percentage of its citizens living abroad than I think any other country in the world, uh, including the children of some of Israel's political leaders. 
by American standards, if the children of our political leaders lived abroad for an extended period, they would certainly reduce in electability. So I'm curious to what extent you see the fact that many of Israel's most talented people live abroad, not necessarily for short periods, but for a large chunk of their career and sometimes, you know, till retirement. How significant is that as a risk to the ongoing entrepreneurial ecosystem? I don't think it is at all. Um, I, I think it's concerning when you look just at the outgoing uh, door, and then it seems like you know there's all the brain drainage and uh, and all that. But I think uh, if if you look at the outgoing door, you have to look at the incoming door. And I think uh, Israel has a lot to gain by having people go out and live uh, in different places for you know five, ten years, and bring back a lot of. Uh, of good DNA, marketing capabilities, understanding different markets, l learning from you know how business operates uh, in places like the the U.S. So it, I think it's it's all it's almost all positive. I, Israel could do, and I think it's starting to do a better job at at getting people back. But I, I wouldn't be concerned about the outgoing direction. I think uh, that's great for the country. I think that the biggest concern I have is that the biggest question you said that the, we're representing the web, I would say that actually the web is not the most successful Israeli high-tech industry. I mean, there's still a lot to prove. And the question is, would, after the economical uh, crisis we experienced, um, and China that is getting cheaper and attractive, and India that is getting cheaper and attractive, would there still be a lot of money in Israel to put in, in fueling the technology and, and the industry that we just show how big it is. And if there would be less money um, in, in that you can raise in Israel, then I think it's going to pose a big problem because then a lot of people wouldn't come back after five to ten years, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's the biggest threat. The biggest threat is would the world keep on you know, voting and giving confidence to the Israeli high-tech industry so that foreign money would be invested in Israeli companies. Okay. Um, my name is Ron Cohn. I actually was born in Israel, but I came here when I was 10 years old. And every time I go back in the last 20 years, I've noticed a greater and greater Americanization of Israel and its society. And as I listen to you three, with two of the three of you speak almost American English. Is this, is Israel becoming the 51st state, as we used to say, or, uh, or is this an international internationalization of American culture? Well, we're just faking the accent. <laughs> so, I was actually going to ask it <laughs> just to make sure you. <laughs> um, I so I don't know any smart answers. There we go. I disagree. I I really disagree. I, we're not trying to be the 51st country, I think that we're not, I think it would be provincial to try to be that. Um, I think the world is becoming global. You see the same stores in London and, and, and New York and you know, there's no big difference in the food you eat elsewhere. It's all big chains and you know, Facebooks, McDonald's. Um, I, I don't see any specific um, thrive in Israel to become the 51st country. I think th there's, yeah, I think there are positive aspects to it. So language uh, being one of them, English is is part of the language in Israel from day one. I think it's one of the only countries outside of the English-speaking countries where where all media, movies, TV, et cetera, are not dubbed but rather subtitled. And I think that lends itself to people hearing more English and, and knowing that. So that's, that, I think, is an asset. Again, uh, you know, if you look at entrepreneurs in France and Germany, they're very uh, local. That, that, that's their business. And language, uh, language and culture, I think, is uh, part of it. But you know, it, those are forces that you can't do much about. I, I'd love to Israel to stay Israel, and I, I think it will, and not, you know, not become the 51st state. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, it's, it's true to some extent that sometimes in Israel, maybe you see it even more than other countries. I think most of the reason is, I mean, we're doing a, a deal with a company in Japan, and I'm amazed, you know, how big the company in Japan is, and they hardly know English. Like, really, we, we're dealing with one of the biggest companies there, and we're spending a lot of time back and forth in there. Uh, and like most of our counterparts speak English, not Americans, totally Israelis are speaking, you know, 
uh, English better. And I think it has to do a lot with the local market. Their local market is big enough for them to not need to expand uh, to English, which is most of the market that we're in. Uh, they have a huge market. They're a very successful company in Japan or in China or in those countries. And I think the, the combination of a small company that the entire market is outside of the country with a lot of entrepreneurship actually creates that. Yeah. I, I think also some, some of what you see from visiting Israel is a bit superficial. So when McDonald's came in, it did a lot of, uh, the, the entrepreneur that got the franchise for McDonald's did an amazing job of localizing it and, and speaking to the, uh, to the local market. Um, when Starbucks uh, tried to ca come in, there was this national joy of, uh, of you know, dumping it and, and kicking it out of the country, and they folded after you know, a year or two. And uh, so you know, a, some of it is a bit superficial. But, but it's still uh, a bit provincial. I just came back from Israel last week, and I, I had a meeting in uh, the Israeli center, which is uh, these big towers in Tel Aviv. And I was <laughs> going through the mall there. And there was just this big opening H&M opened their first store in Israel. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. I, there was a line, literally, of people waiting. And there was like a movie theater of, of that, Swedish. Yeah, that's the Swedishization of Israel. Right, exactly. Right. And I was like, what are they doing here? You know, H&M is not so great. You know, it's, uh, you know, they were just waiting there, you know, hours and hours and hours in lines to get and buy into it. So there is some it's kind like of a... It's like the IKEA craziness, It's like right? the IKEA so craziness. So there is some the type of, uh, you know... Uh, yeah. Did you get a feel of Sweden in Israel? Right. <laughs>